Deadly silent. <laughs> uh, okay, hi everybody. Um, welcome back to pretty much everybody, I think, um, to the second talk of the year. First one was the welcome talk last week. Um, got my ugly mug again just for this one, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not giving any more talks this year, so you'll have far more interesting people to, uh, to have talk to you. Um, this talk's going to be about, uh, essentially, how to do art if you're no good at art. Um, this is probably quite useful for the computer scientists among us. Uh, no offence to you guys, but we're not the best. Um, uh, but everybody else, I'm sure, uh, getting stuck into a bit of art. And there's, there's also stuff, even if you are good at art, that's going to be relevant in here, so you're not missing out. Uh, yes, yeah, so... I say we've all got many great, get great game ideas. Um, okay, some of us might not have any idea at all of what we want to do in our games yet, but that will come in time. Um, there are plenty of great game ideas out there. Uh, sometimes you'll just get given them during the day by lecturers, uh, as happened in the last couple of days for us. But uh, um, a lot of the time, you'll find you need some kind of artwork in it. Uh, if it's if it's graphical. So if you're doing a text adventure game, this is irrelevant for you, or is it? Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about how to make uh, something that looks and sounds great. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about how you can um, you can get assets from online. You can get assets that you've made yourself, and most importantly, you can get assets from each other. So. Uh, and how you can get these assets to work well in a game uh, without actually needing to put in all that much effort. Here's a couple of examples of games that I picked um, that are not too art, well, not massively art heavy. This one's uh, Coming Out Simulator, which is a text adventure game. See, I mentioned that earlier. Um, a text adventure game which has very minimal kind of art style. Uh, projector. Uh, a very minimal art style, but it's um, very effective in the game. Uh, I won't go into it too much because it's actually quite a fun game you might want to play yourself, and I won't spoil it. But uh, uh, and the other game you might recognise it's called Geometry Wars. It was a very popular um, Xbox game Xbox. when it originally came out. Uh, yeah, Xbox Live Arcade. Um, it actually has very little art in it at all. It's just geometry. So you know regular shapes like uh, circles and squares, a few rhombuses and lines, but a crap ton of effects, effectively, um, that make it look really, really cool and effective, and it just makes you super hyped to play the game. So, um, small amount of art, huge effect, is basically what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, I'm going to quickly go off on a massive tangent before we even get started with the, uh, the talk proper. This is a game that I made. It's called The Legend of Shoe, and I'm really, really proud of it. You might guess that I'm not really, really proud of it because of the art. Uh, the main character is some sort of tooth that's been coloured blue. Uh, the main enemies are yellow circles that are sort of pixelated. This is lava, not that you know it, and this is rock. Um, uh, I made this in a 48 hour competition about three years ago, and um, I spent maybe five seconds on the art. And this is because I didn't care what the art looked like, okay? The most important thing about this for me was actually level design, because I suck at level design, and I wanted to get better at it. Um, I tried to find, you'll notice that there's a big white gap there, I tried to find the actual view of the entire level, it was like pretty massive, but I spent a long time on it, there was a lot of progression, uh, and when I submitted it to uh, the Game Jam, Ludendare, uh, I got a lot of positive feedback about the level design. So that was the most important bit to me, so even if you want to do art, um, 
uh, sorry, even if you don't want to do art but you do want to make a game, don't sweat it. Um, you can do a game without any art in it at all, or with you know programmer art as it's so called. Uh, and really, if you don't care, that's the most important thing. Uh, so now I've completely invalidated the rest of the talk. Let's go on. So, place one you can get things from is other people, specifically, uh, specifically online. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple of places where you can get really good resources. But first, I'm going to talk about licensing. Uh, there are, uh, I'm sure if any of you have used stuff from the internet before, you'll know that there's this whole can of worms with um, how people have licensed their kind of art assets, so image, video, music, whatever. Um, if you can, go for public domain stuff because the people who have released it into the public domain, they want you to use it, that's why they've released it so freely. Um, and essentially you can do anything you want with it. Uh, you can um, change it, you can sell it if you want. You can, you can sell public domain stuff that's not yours, right? Is this the ball? Yes. The ball. No, the ball is next door. door I think. You, you, can, you can sell public domain stuff. Okay. Yep, you can sell it, uh, you can change it. You don't have to reference who it belongs to, anything like that. Um, and, but when, you, when you're looking at stuff that's um, come from online, you'll generally find it under a Creative Commons license. And this is the full range of Creative Commons licenses that are out there at the moment. Um, you've got the most open one, which is uh, public domain. It's not really a Creative Commons license, but they just have one called um, Zero, which is the same thing as a public domain license. Um, and then it goes down to Buy, which means that if you are telling, uh, if you're, uh, if you're using the art asset anywhere, even if you changed it, you have to tell people where you got it from. So you say, you know, this belonged to, oh, this was from Joe Blogs at joeblogs.com or whatever. Uh, this is share alike. It means that if you use it, you also have to put whatever you've made under the same license. So um, if there's an art asset that somebody has released under share alike, then you have to also use share alike and uh, whatever, attribution uh, uh, to release your game or whatever. So um, it's fairly permissive, but it means that you have to, you have to bear that stuff in mind. Uh, then you get down to non-commercial. Uh, it's the same, but you're not allowed to sell whatever you use it in. That's actually quite a popular one for um, kind of art assets. You'll find a lot of stuff uh, that people are giving away for free under non-commercial licenses. So you can use their stuff for free, but you can't sell whatever you use it in. Uh, occasionally, you'll also find them selling the same assets without the non-commercial restrictions. So you can buy them off them and then use it in something that you're selling yourself. Uh, then you've got, just got share, which has the additional restriction of uh, non-derivative, which means that you're allowed to use it, but not change it. Uh, and that always comes with attribution and sometimes, again, non-commercial, so. Uh, and then the most restrictive license they can put it under is all rights reserved, which basically means you're not allowed to use it at all. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes you'll also find images are released under, um, like, unusual licenses like the GPL, that's particularly if it's if it was originally bundled with some piece of software, like a game maybe. Um, basically it comes down to always check what license something's been released under before you use it just in case you get tripped up by it. <coughs> Here's a really nice picture from the Wikimedia Commons and I'm now allowed to use that because it's public domain. Uh, they have a ridiculously massive uh, selection of uh, artworks, uh, they've also got sounds, uh, data sets as well I think are on there, but um, a massive, massive amount of stuff that you can just go in. Everything has a license, very clearly labelled, it's very often public domain as well, I think about half the things are on there in public domain. Uh, you can search for anything and it will come up. Uh, unfortunately the stuff that's on there is uh, rarely games related, so you're not going to find a perfect sprite sheet that's um, got like eight different animations for a walking and running wizard or something like that. Uh, but you will find some fantastic photos like this one. 
Uh, if you need a bit of inspiration or something, I mean, I look at that and I just want to make a game, to be honest. Uh, another good source, a very, very popular one that you'll see used all the time, is opengameart.org. Um, it's probably the biggest repository of games related art online, and very similar to Wikimedia Commons. Uh, very similar to Wikimedia Commons, uh, opengameart.org. Uh, has stuff that's under a huge range of licenses and they're normally very permissive, so you can use it in, in almost anything you like. Unlike Wikimedia Commons, it's actually games related, so you're going to have a lot more luck finding things like sprite sheets, um, sets of tiles that you want to use in a sort of 2D game, as well as more interesting things like a, a 3D modeling. Uh, I am going to talk mostly about 2D stuff, I'm afraid, this in this thing, just because that's what I know more about, but a lot of it's very applicable as well. As well. Uh, yes, and also there's uh, quite a lot of music and sound effects. A lot of game devs will just jump straight into freesound.org, which is uh, a sound a sound website that's very similar to Open Game Art, but just for any kind of sounds. Um, that's actually what we did uh, when we made Semaphore Beginners, which you might have seen. Uh, the lovely ding sound when you complete something is from freesound.org. I could have just gone to Open Game Out and found something very similar with a bit less searching around, but um, another fantastic source. Around the time of game jams, so that's actually all the time to be honest because there's so many game jams these days, but uh, some, yeah, some game jams are, uh, are, more, uh, are better for this than others, particularly Proc Jam actually. Uh, and Ludendare, which I haven't mentioned, but uh, oh yeah, Ludendare. Um, uh, around these times, so Ludendare is April, August, December, and Prog Jam is November. Yeah. You'll often find on Twitter, uh, under these hashtags, or on the respective websites for these jams, you'll find lists and lists of reams of people who are giving away art assets that they've created for free for use in other projects. Uh, something that is worth noting there, particularly for Ludum Dare, uh, is that for Ludum Dare, you're not allowed to enter the compo, which is the traditional competition, if you've used our assets from elsewhere. So you will have to make your own stuff to enter the normal compo in Ludum Dare. They have a second, comp uh, second kind of parallel competition, which is called the Jam which is more permissive, and you get an extra day as well, and you can work in teams. So if you uh, want to use our assets from this section of the talk, head in there, into the jam, and you'll, you'll have everything you need. Uh, Game Art Guppy is just another website, similar to Open Game Art and stuff, but particularly not free. It's cheap, so you, you pay a very small amount, like one or two dollars, and you get a big set of stuff that you can do whatever you like with. I only mention it as a sort of uh, a non-free alternative to some of the other websites. Um, and as such, it's a bit better curated and all the stuff on there is generally of a very high quality. But maybe you're a purist, maybe you don't want to use other people's stuff and you just want to work for yourself or you want to enter the Loom Dory compo and you need to do it for yourself. Oh, side note. Uh, Ludum Dare's rules do let you use fonts from the internet. You don't have to make your own fonts. That would be a bit unfair. Uh, so you want to learn how to do it yourself. Well, step one is go simple, OK? Uh, there's nothing like jumping into a brand new project and you think you're going to go for uh, you know, a massively multiplayer online RPG with photorealistic 3D graphics, uh, an online shop, and um, Bluetooth controls. Uh, go simple, and that especially applies to the art. This is a game called Nidog. Um, I expect a fair few of you will have heard of it or know of it. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it last week. Uh, fencing simulator, sort of. It's a bit silly. Uh, every time you die, you sort of explode. And I think orange has lost quite a lot here because there's a lot of orange goo on the ground. but. Uh, they fight each other, one of them gets eaten by a giant worm at the end. They're the winner. Huh? They're the winner. 
And that's the winner, yeah. <laughs> um, and this is great because it's very simple. You can see exactly what's going on. It doesn't require a lot of animation, which is especially important for us. And it looks very effective. And then you come to about a month or two ago when they released the first assets for Nidor 2, which looks a bit like this. Uh, the characters are sort of, uh, they've got joint animations, uh, so they're well articulated. Uh, the background has got glow effects, it looks really pretty. The, uh, the ground has got like really cool archways. Even this thing that says go, which comes up in the other game as well, but it's just the word go with an arrow. Uh, it's stylized, it's artistic, and this might just be personal opinion, but I think this looks infinitely worse, um, particularly when it comes to the characters. I'm not really sure what they were going for there, but I don't think it paid off. Less is more, okay? A good way to force yourself into this simplicity is to ensure, to force yourself to uh, have limitations on what you can do. So this here is a game making tool uh, and game playing tool called Pico 8, which gives you a 160 by 160 screen. It gives you 16 colors maximum. Uh, it gives you a sprite editing tool, which lets you make 8 by 8 pixel sprites. Uh, and you can't do very much with it. And that's a good thing because it means you have to be clever and imaginative with how you do stuff. You also get like a, a, a maximum amount of code you can write for it as well. I think it's like 8,000 characters. Symbols. Symbols. Yeah, so like 8,000 variables, which is not really much of a limitation. No, I'm but pretty sure it's 8,000 characters. No, it's, it's definitely symbols. If you write, if you extend the number of like letters in the variable names, it doesn't add to the number of... Oh, I thought it decreased the number of... Yeah, no, no, no. Symbols. That's a bit easier. Um, but, <coughs> yes, so... Uh, that's a really fun restriction. I actually made Flappy Bird in it, like, last week for a bit of fun. Uh, other good restrictions that work are only basic shapes. You saw that in Geometry Wars, and you'll see it again for this one. Maximum of two colours. This is a great one. Uh, a couple of years ago, we ran a theme... Uh, the current theme is retro, by the way, remember that. Uh, we ran a theme called Black and White. Um, it wasn't necessarily colour related, I mean, you could make a game like the game Black and White, which existed in like 19 whenever, or you could uh, have like a moral choice system or something like that. But um, the Black and White theme created a huge number of really cool games. I think my personal favourite was the one where there was a white square and a black square on a world that was entirely coloured black and white. So if the black character went over a black piece of world, you couldn't see where it was. The white character went over a white piece of world, you couldn't see where they were and they had to kill each other. It was very, very good. And it's not on the website. I tried to find oh. a picture of it. But, uh, it I didn't it know who made it. Ben, wasn't it? Was it not Ben? I, know, I thought it was Ben. No, maybe it wasn't Ben. Okay. It oh, was somebody. It was really good. Sorry, you missed it. <laughs> uh, 80 by 60 pixels, another theme that we ran. Um, that was actually before I got here, but the games were good enough that I've heard about them. In particular, there was a game which created an 80 by 60 window, which uh, had a ball in it that bounced off the edges of the window, and you had to move the window so that the ball could bounce around a maze that was hidden until you moved the, the window over it. So you sort of had a very small window into a much larger world that you, you walked around. It was, <coughs> well, that you bounced a ball around. It was very, very cool, and very difficult <coughs> as well. Uh, not very much art, but very effective. I think you've got the gist now. A couple of, uh, um, just the one jam, Game Boy Jam, which is actually running right now and ends in four days' time, uh, is a game where you, uh, a jam where you have to make a game like a Game Boy game, which means you're allowed a screen which is 160 by 144 or something like that. Uh, you're only allowed to use four colors, preferably the four traditional Game Boy colours of dark green, middly dark green, slightly lighter green, and light green. <laughs> but, I mean, if anybody 
I, I strongly suggest that after this talk and after the pub, you um, go home and Google GB Jam and look at some of the, the animated GIFs that have come out of it because they are absolutely astonishing and I am incredibly jealous. <laughs> and you will be too. And inspired, but mostly jealous. Step two, I've mentioned it in, in passing, but be, be careful with your <coughs> colours. So uh, one way to cheat at this is to limit your colour palette to two, three or four colours, something like that. Uh, but if you are going to have a colourful game, make sure that your colours work together. A, a pretty new mistake, uh, a very, very common mistake, is to just open paint, open the, the colour selection tool, uh, pick your favourite colour, draw a shape, pick another colour, draw a shape, pick another colour, draw a shape. And you can create pretty cool art that way, uh, especially when you're doing kind of 2D sprites. But what you uh, a, a cheap and easy way to create something that looks really effective is to uh, find colours that work together really well. You won't immediately notice a difference, but it, it kind of has a sort of passive effect on how good, realistic, or um, pleasant your sprites are to look at. Uh, this is one example of a tool that helps you do just that really easily. It's called Adobe Color CC, but anybody from a couple of years ago will know it as Kula. Uh, you pick a color and you pick uh, <coughs> some way of getting the other colors. So uh, there's complementary, which will just show you colors that work really nicely with it, or uh, triad. Uh, nobody really knows what these things are, I'm sure, but. Uh, it's a really quick way of finding colours that work nicely together. So you say, I've got a red for the body armour of this character. I want a nice yellow colour for the um, great big bolt of lightning that comes out of his hand whenever he shakes hands with somebody. And uh, you got yellow. So uh, all these colours, I mean, you wouldn't be able to tell that just by looking at it from the normal colour yellow, but when it's in a game with other sprites, it makes it very subtle but uh, important difference to how your sprites come out. Uh, another similar tool is uh, Paloton. Generally, um, this one's for making kind of shading. Uh, that's what that's what I use it for. Uh, if you've got like a main uh, a main body color and you want a bit of highlighting, say a, a, a streak of white down or a streak of lighter color down one side, a streak of darker color down the other side, just to give it a bit of a kind of 3D effect. Um, you'll just put in your colour and then it'll give you the lighter and darker shades that work best um, according to human vision generally uh, with that colour. Again, really easy, really nice. And another thing that's good about this website is that um, if down here is a colour blind button uh, and if you click that it will show you uh, what it looks like if say your um, people who are playing the game are red, green, colour blind or maybe can't see colour at all. Um, and it gives you a chance to um, make sure that one thing is distinguishable from another. So if someone completely can't see colour and you've got um, a darkish blue on a darkish red background, it might be completely invisible to them. So uh, it's a very cheap and easy way of checking that your, your game works for colour blind people. And, I mean, if you can, why not, right? I've mentioned about making sprites. Uh, there are so many tools for making sprites. Uh, here's just a few. Uh, Paint, uh, Microsoft Paint, or the much better Paint.net, which is available for Windows. It's just a paint program, but it's got all the tools you need, really. You could do anything in Paint.net that you could do elsewhere. It would just take longer. Uh, a few of the most popular ones are Pixel Edit, which I know a few people in the society swear by. Uh, Piss scale, which is basically the same, as far as I can tell. Graphic scale, which I think you have to buy, but uh, a lot of people seem to like it. And acid I think it's pronounced a sprite. A um, I didn't know about a sprite until yesterday, where somebody at the um, workshop was using it. It looks really cool. It looks like it's got a huge number of tools as part of it. So. 
honestly, the best thing to do if you want to make 2D sprites is um, download a few of these, give them all a try, see which one you like best, because the tools are just going to work for you or not work for you. Um, the more complicated programs will oftentimes require a bit of getting used to. Like I did put a program called GIMP up here, which is like a very complicated uh, image editing program, uh, because honestly, if you're making sprites, you're much better off with something that's more designed for the job. Uh, and I am, as, as I've mentioned, I'm terrible at art, so uh, I've had to use from time to time tutorials, and here's a great few tutorials. Um, this person called Saint Eleven, Saint Eleven does a massive number of tutorials on his, uh, or he posts them on his Twitter feed. I think they're available to his Patreon subscribers. Um, so if you wanted to do that. Uh, 2dwillneverdie.com, which is a very optimistic name, but uh, again, a huge number of tutorials. Uh, I had a look at them earlier. Some of them are quite advanced, but uh, there's also some very basic ones like how to make sprites. And uh, those were really good, and I actually learned a few things this morning. And opengameart.org, uh, I mentioned it before, they have a tutorial section. The tutorials are all uploaded by the community, so they're of varying quality. But if you want to learn how to do something, you'll almost definitely be able to find out how to do that something on opengameart.org. Uh, okay, so you've made your really terrible art. <laughs> Step one complete. Now, how do you make your game look good anyway? The answer is a thing called juice. So, juice is effectively um, making your game feel responsive, making your game feel exciting, uh, and all of this is done using a surprisingly small and simple set of techniques. Uh, I'm going to summarize this person's talk, of uh, these two people's talk, I suppose. Uh, they <coughs> did a fantastic talk called Juice It or Lose It. Uh, I highly recommend it to everybody, including if you've already seen it, it's that good. Um, it goes over the basics in about 20 minutes, uh, so I'm going to do it in about one minute. Um, your techniques effectively boil down to uh, things like screen shake, uh, which just means making the screen wobble a little bit every time something cool happens in, uh, in your game. So if your um, they did break out, so a good example would be if your, uh, if the, the puck hits your paddle, a little bit of screen shake, it makes it feel like more of a, a, a response and it feels like something big has actually happened even if it is quite a small effect. Um, they reckon googly eyes, they put googly eyes on their paddle which follow the balls. You can do that if you like. Um, it's a bit of a silly effect. It's just adding, um, adding, think, adding, changing, um, visuals to a fairly basic underlying thing. So, uh, another one would be changing the size of things and scale of things a little bit. So if your puck hits one of the uh, blocks in breakout, have the uh, block grow and shrink or uh, do a sort of wobble uh, and then pop, disappear. Um, and all of, these, all of these things are helped greatly by sound. So uh, when, your ball, uh, when your puck hits the paddle, have a nice, surprising even, uh, and it looks a bit less kind of boring. Uh, the person who came up with the idea of using easing functions in movement is actually a guy called Robert Penner. Um, he's the one who separated out uh, this sort of smooth movement into very simple, easy to use uh, mathematical functions. He goes over it in quite a lot of detail on his website, and uh, Gamma Sutra actually covers the idea of using tweening and things like that to make a really effective, simple uh, game. This is a sort of uh, a, a basic tutorial that covers all of these things. Uh, Flambeer, some of you might have heard of Flambeer. Uh, they are a independent uh, developer of really, really cool. Um, games, and they're from Sweden, 
up there somewhere. Scandinavia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Glam Ben. <laughs> They've done a 44 minute long talk. Again, very well worth the watch. If you put that one and the other one together, you get about an hour, so it's great to be in between some lectures that you don't want to watch. Um, this is a game they made. It's called Super Crate Box. All that happens in the entire game is this character jumps around, these things fall down to the bottom, and occasionally pop out the top again. And this character shoots these. It is one of the most fun games you can possibly find to play. It's the original was free. I don't think it's still free, is it? Is it it's Super Crate Box? The Super always means it's like a paid and yeah. polished version. Yeah, Crate Box is actually a flash game. You can play it online. Uh, Super Crate Box is on Steam, or you can get it from them directly. It's about two quid, one quid, something like that. Uh, my friend Amy has about 50 hours in it. And given how simple I've, uh, I've just told you uh, the content of the game is, that's quite impressive. Um, what happens is, every time this character picks up one of these boxes, he gets given a random gun from a set of about 10 guns. Um, every single time this character jumps, it plays a lovely wow sort of sound. Every time uh, this character falls, uh, these or these fall off, it makes a noise. Um, Any time this character falls down, it screen shakes a bit because it's so massive. Any time this character fires a gun, the screen shakes because the bullet is quite massive as well. It is a fantastic piece of design. If you want to find out how to take something really simple and make it really effective using only the techniques that I've basically described here, this is the place to do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a case study uh, of kind of absolute perfection as far as make, uh, adding juice goes. Uh, and the last thing which they also do is add particle effects. So any game engine that you care to mention has got some kind of particle effect system in it. Um, adding particles is effectively, uh, a particle is generally just a tiny little um, image uh, that's very, very simple to reproduce. So if you wanted to make a smoke effect, you take a, a tiny little uh, picture of a, a little cloud of smoke, you add a, a couple of hundred of them at the same time, and the game engine would just say, okay, I'll just add a couple of hundred. It's easy enough for the game engine because it's such a simple sprite and all you're doing is moving it around, generally. And um, you can make a really effective kind of cloud effect just by having a load of these, or you can make um, an explosion just by adding a load of colorful sprites. I believe this game, yep, yeah, that's a flamethrower he's using there. And these are the flames. They're just weird, colourful blobs. Uh, it fires out about 20 of them in any given second. And it does look very effective in game. Uh, this screenshot actually just shows you know, a single stream of fire, but it really, really does look good. Uh, this is also a particle effect, another fire effect. Lots of white, a bit of yellow, and some orange particles all coming out of here. In case you get it. Because it uses a bit of randomness to decide where to place the particles, you get some big ones that come off like this, and it looks really, really cool. And surprisingly realistic for something that takes maybe a good 15 seconds if you already know the particle engine. Uh, particle engines are really cool. All, all of your games should have particle effects, and if you come to the Red Pro Showcase next week without them, you'll be cast out. Okay, maybe not, but still. Okay. So I've told you how to do it yourself, and now you're probably thinking that sounds like a terrible idea. So don't. You should cheat. I made this game. It's called Glide. It's available on the Play Store now for free. Just got to get that in there anytime time I do a talk. <laughs> um, I did not make the art for this game. Uh, for a start, there is very little art in the game. As I mentioned earlier, one quick way to get art is to do uh, regular shapes. The circles are about as regular as you can get. Uh, so everything in the game is, is, is a circle, uh, apart from the text. Um, I tried this game on somebody's Kindle, uh, their Amazon Kindle, I think it was yours, and the pixels weren't square. 
on, on the device's screen, which meant that every single circle in the game was oval shaped. <laughs> we were going to use it at the Freshers' Fair last year, and that didn't happen. I can't deal with ovals. It's got to be circles. So yes, the art for this game was very, very easy to come up with. But something like the colours, even, is difficult. Okay. Because there's so little art in the game, something like colours has to be considered very carefully. I'm terrible at colours, so I got my friend to do it. And that's what cheating's all about. There are so many people around, particularly in the society now, who are um, interested in doing art, interested in doing music, interested in doing um, games writing for inside of your game. Uh, and if you need help finding those people, we will be more than happy to put you in touch with them. Because uh, there's nothing more satisfying than knowing you're good at something and having somebody want your help with it. So, If you want teammates to work with in a, in a team project, um, <coughs> just come and find us or just ask on our Facebook group and uh, people will reach out to you if they're available. Obviously, people are sometimes busy, so you have to work around schedules and stuff. But by and large, it's pretty easy to find somebody who wants to do something with you. If you want to do, or if you're, if you're not too interested in programming or actual development, and you'd much rather just do a bit of art, you're probably not in this room, or um, a bit of music or a bit of writing, then just uh, let us know, because that's really helpful for us as well. If, if you want to find a project uh, to work with, but you, you don't want to make a game all, all yourself because you're not too interested in one aspect or the other, just let us know. Um, with that in mind, there is somebody who told me that I should mention him. He's called Dan Giddens. He does uh, music. He's a, a very talented musician. And if you want music for your games, he can hook you up. Um, I've got some of his stuff, but I'm planning on putting one of my games in a bit. But there will always be somebody around for that. So get in touch with us or get in touch with each other. Uh, Facebook group is probably the best place for it. The Discord also is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, get on that. Okay, so that's the end of the, the main bit of the talk. Uh, a couple of dates that are still to come in this term. We've got the first showcase, which is next week. The theme is retro. Uh, feel free to take on board any of the limitations that I mentioned earlier. So. A, a, Small screen size, a few number of colors. Um, this is an example of some good pixel art. Uh, it was for a game that I worked on, and Jamie worked on, and Chris worked on. And we cheated. We got somebody else to do the art for us. It was somebody else in the team. <coughs> I think all three of us are more than happy to say that we're terrible at art. Yeah. Uh, seriously, you should see some of the games that me and Jamie have worked on on our own without, without cheating. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. <laughs> Zero Hour Game Jam. I mentioned it last week and I'll mention it again. It is in two weeks' time when the clocks go back. So it's between 1 a.m. and 1 a.m. on Sunday, which is a bit awkward because it's a Sunday at 1 a.m. But we will probably be in the Department of Computer Science just uh, chilling out for an hour and making something really hectically. The Gaming Social. Uh, that will happen in week five, so the following week after that. And we're just going to get together and play games. There will be things. Soon. And the 48 hour jam, which is an entire weekend where we book out a room and people can get together and work on stuff, or you can work on it on your own if you're uh, not planning on cheating. Uh, that's an entire weekend, and that is week seven. I appreciate that end of term time is sometimes a little bit busy. But it's a nice chance to get to relax and uh, not get too bored with <coughs> stuff. So come along, it's going to be great. And uh, here's all the usual Facebook group, Discord, and uh, the IRC channel. IRC is old. Uh, Twitter, Games Careers if you're interested in a, game, uh, a career in game design. Uh, our event schedule, which is constantly kept up to date. And that will be that will tell you where our next event is, uh, where are the workshop and talk next week, Jamie. Yes. Uh, it, well, the showcase is in here. Showcase is in here. That's easy. Um, and the workshop 
is in, uh, I will have to consult that schedule. Uh, it's in S2 something, isn't it? That sounds about right. Uh, oh no, it's in R. Oh yeah, it's, oh, no, it's, oh, it's in oh, it's in the Rample building. Yeah, yeah it's, it's 104, building, 104. Which is just up there. Look for the, look for our sign, or for one of us, we'll be there. It's R103. <laughs> R103, nice and easy to find. Okay, so uh, I've run out of steam. Uh, so has anybody got any questions? Hi, Thomas. Are there options to make it deliberately bad? And that's yes. your excuse. George Jamie. Um, so I, I made a game a while ago called The Banker, and I spent the whole thing programming it completely from scratch, uh, and then I, I, I got to the end, I'm like, okay, the game works now, uh, and I've got zero hours to make the art, because it was a Ludendare compo, uh, and I just had to use the submission hour to put all of the art in, just do it wildly in GIMP with absolutely no method at all. Uh, and I, even though it does look like crap, it looks awful, uh, I've been complimented on it simply because it's consistently crap. <laughs> like, it all looks cohesive and it's kind of believable, like you can get in, like, what defines when someone, uh, like, what defines realism is consistency, so if you have a bad, like, if you have bad art but it's all bad in the same way, uh, <laughs> Then actually, people, uh, the the like the human eye is great for consistency, uh, and it likes seeing consistency. It likes making rules and seeing things conform to them. Uh, so it, yeah, they absolutely make art that is purposefully bad, uh, but make sure that it's all bad in the same way. Exactly right. Uh, anybody else? Chris, uh, are these going to be online? These slides are already online. Dictionary.co.uk slash non-art. <laughs> yeah. They're also on my blog, dictionary.co.uk slash blog, and it just says link to the art on art slides. Christian? Does all right slides say a few words about 3D modeling? Please do, yes. I mentioned that I'm I'm not a 3D modeler. I don't know anything about 3D modeling. Does all right come on? By all means. Thanks. For a couple of minutes, so. Yeah, yeah. I won't take too long. OK, so um, I just want to have a curiosity. Is there anyone here who is interested in 3D modeling? Uh, well, let's start from the beginning. Does anyone know what I mean when I say 3D modeling? Okay, those who really don't and want to know, and those who are really shy, of course, put their hands up for a second, uh, for an extra set hands up. <laughs> Beautiful, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Um, right. So, 3D modeling is essentially the process of carving out shapes in 3D using a software that we did like to call. Uh, very, you know, humorously, 3D modeling software. Um, there are three main ones for this. Uh, this is Blender, which is your main free open source, always in development. Um, generally, Herald does the most complex of the three, um, but that's really a matter of how you use it. If you learn it correctly, you'll be fine. Uh, there's Maya, which is often endorsed by industry. Uh, you can get it on the educational license for, I believe, three years. And it does have a very, very in-depth set of tutorials. It's entirely your own um, choice which one you want to go for. And there is a third one which escapes my thought right now, but it's still the 3DS Max. Two. The, the 3DS Max, yeah. 3DS Max, uh, I don't see as often when it comes to tutorials, but I'm pretty sure that's also very well used in the industry. You might be able to get educational license on that. So expensive. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> uh, educational license also comes with a lovely cravat that you can't publish games for any commercial purpose, as usually that does entail. So, I wanted to quickly say that um, if you are in 3D modeling for a purpose, so you like 3D games, so Unity users, uh, Unreal users, uh, if you have a certain mod tool or engine that you like, so I don't know if anyone here remembers Amnesia and Dark Descent, uh, there is a very, very good set of mod tools that do crash quite often, um, but you can often uh, import your own 3D models into there and you know, for enemies, for scenery as such, and there is a very good set of tutorials for Blender and Maya for um, both use of the software and for porting your own engine. So please have a look on YouTube. And if I can, I'd like to recommend a certain channel. Uh, not my own. <laughs> I'm not endorsed. Don't get me wrong. I use this channel myself for um, for learning Blender myself. And if anyone here likes, you know, uh, just as a quick uh, word, 3D modeling does not necessarily have to relate to games. You may have an 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 incredibly fascinating interest in interior design. That's also cool. And the channel's name is 4CG. 
So here you'll find a whole bunch of very professional quality tutorials about how to use Blender. This is the newest version of Blender, or a few versions back, and they are generally talking about basic tool sets. Uh, there are some here about the game engine that's part of Blender. It does have its own game engine, believe it or not, um, which I haven't gone through myself, and I'd probably say that if you are looking at 3D modeling and game making in general, you'll go for a dedicated game engine, per se. Unreal, uh, Unreal and Unity come to mind immediately. If there's any others, then do forgive me, I forgot. So this tutorial series goes straight through things like the interfaces, uh, animation rigging, um, cutting through, like, you know, uh, beveling edges to create a certain shape. You can go through, uh, there's a further down around part 20 or 30 through the series, they're talking about rigging an animation, uh, rigging the skeleton to a 3D model for Steve. Um, you know, Steve, the Minecraft main character. Of, uh, very well known as that Minecraft guy. Um, you, you do get a sort of um, prospect for what sort of um, system animations are. Very basic. I will, I will be complete. I'll be completely honest there. You've got about what uh, ten bones in his body, max. So maybe I'm missing one or two, but it is very in depth there. I will say if you wanted to go through learning a 3D modeling tool on your own. Go through this tutorial series is great for just the basics. If you are more interested in like going even further, textures, whatnot, UV mapping especially, there are more dedicated tutorials, but not on this channel. I suggest you look more on YouTube. So to go through this entire series will probably take you a week, or say two if you're spacing it out. So please don't get scared by 3D modeling. It is a very, how do I put it, when you never use a tool before like Game Maker, it often seems like a big hurdle to jump over to try and understand what's going on. But it's more a matter of if you try and dig your teeth in, learn the resources. So you will look at the interfaces to start off with. You'll do a small project. They'll often do a project on video, and you'll just copy them, per se. And once they're done, they'll be like, OK, you go and do whatever you want with it now. And it's that sort of experimentation that's really what leads up to the best learning experience. So thank you very much. Are you coming to the pub? Yeah, uh, although I'm going back into Nautilus. OK, so if anybody wants to hear a little bit more about 3D modeling, then be able to talk to you at the pub. Sure. Fantastic. Cheers. OK, um, yeah, we're heading off now. For any of you who don't know, we're going to the Phantom Coach. It's just the other